Um, and I've, I feel really embarrassed because I've heard about uh, a minute of Drew, um, a minute of Bill, um, and um, what I was hoping to do was build on um, some of the things that have been discussed this morning, um, but spe specifically in terms of how do we how do we develop an environment in our schools in which um, we can we can rethink assessment, rethink the purpose of education, rethink um, how we work, um, how we define the process of teaching and enabling. And so one thing that, that's going to be working really well, I'm going to stick to my 10 minutes, is I absolutely agree with everything that has been discussed so far because I was in that, I attended that rethinking assessment um, uh, seminar uh, that, that was discussed earlier at which uh, Lord Baker spoke. Um, I have, I have, I'm doing some work with Peter Hyman at, at, at Big Education and um, what was discussed earlier in terms of Guy Claxton and Becky Carlson, who's a good friend of mine, um, that learning power approach we, we, uh, is a very strong element of what we develop at our school. So what I'm going to talk about is that we aren't going to enable our children to be confident, independent, um, autonomous, innovative, critical thinkers if we aren't then creating an environment in our schools which is doing the very same for, for the adults. Um, and by adults, I mean all the staff, the teachers, the learning coaches, however you want to describe them. If we're not facilitating an environment that is enable them, enabling them to think and learn, then we are going to be limited in terms of the impact that we have on children. So if we want... Um, if we want our teachers to be more innovative in looking at different ways of assessing our children's learning and our progress, um, then I would argue that we need to create an environment which reflects and um, commends their professionalism and innovation. And so just a little bit of background to my work. Um, and rather than going through lots of slides, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do it from the point of a, a story, really. Um, so... When I first started teaching, I was working in uh, Stratford in East London, pre-Olympic uh, Stadium, pre-Westfields. Um, and immediately, I was um, fascinated by the fact that the, the quality of a child's learning experiences in a primary school was dependent on the teacher that they had. Um, and I, I felt that this was inherently unfair. So where, where you had some teachers who were motivated, optimistic, innovative, um, believed in high expectations for all. Equally, there were teachers who who were very much the opposite. And what I realised is that I, in my first class as an NQT, I taught a year five and six uh, uh, mixed class. And some of the children I, I, I had coming up to me couldn't even read, and yet they'd been in school um, throughout their, th right from the beginning. And what I realised was, um, and my research has demonstrated this, and, and my readings have demonstrated this, the greatest single if influence on the quality of children's learning experiences in schools. The number one influence is the quality of teaching. Um, number two is leadership. So if I can combine the two, if I can create an environment in which myself as a learning leader am focused on the professional learning and development of my staff, um, that is the key to enabling the, me to have the greatest impact upon our children's learning experiences. And what I'd also argue is that um, the best teachers, um, the most um, thoughtful teachers and reflective practitioners will have the greatest impact on the widest range of children. Um, so fast forward in terms of my doctoral research, my doctoral research over eight years um, focused on the factors that impact upon teacher engagement in professional learning. Cool, Bob. And can I just, yeah. hey, Tom here, can I just nip in here? Um, yep. Your presentation is actually on screen now, so you can actually control it yourself. If you just hover your mouse over it, I don't know if you're okay. on the laptop, but you you can well, control that yourself and just I, I I'm doing it at the moment, but I'm you know you can do it. You know what? Uh, do you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna move away from the um, the right. presentation as okay. such. Um, but if I can ask you, um, if you can just go to the seventh slide, because I'm yeah. going to just sit on that for a bit. Yeah. Um, because this is yeah. this is about um, 
how as a researcher we can combine and it's a shame actually tom because i could hear you before before 10 o'clock this morning we didn't even get a chance to meet but hopefully we can do that after no um so, so halfway through my doctoral research um i took on my first headship which i was appointed in sort of easter 2012 to take on the school in september 2012. so what you'll see on your screen is um is the context that i inherited and a few weeks before I started, the school was put into a, a, a category of requiring improvement. Um, the, the children were underperforming. Um, and I think if I'd been appointed after that judgment or I'd been interviewed after that judgment, they probably wouldn't have appointed me. And what I inherited was a, a teaching team that were on their knees. You know, like a lot of schools that aren't doing so well, people are working incredibly hard, but don't seem to be having the impact. And um, I met my school improvement partner, um, and you're, you're lucky if you're a head of a school which is uh, inadequate or client improvement because you get twice as many visits from your um, school improvement partner. Um, I think you can sense the irony in, in that statement. And she met me and she sat me down and she said, what's your plan? And I said, look, I've been doing my doctoral research for four years and I've been looking at workplace learning theories. I've been looking at how hairdressers learn, steel workers learn construction workers learn and i'm going to i'm going to uh, i'm going to create a completely different environment for teacher learning what we're going to do we're going to we're not going to have any judgment or lesson observations we're going to we're going to take our time to consider our craft and what we're going to do is we're going to engage in learning over time so for this entire term we're going to engage in understanding the work of dylan william and professor paul black we're going to look at assessment for learning um, and each year group of three teachers um, and support staff is going to come up with a research question that they are then going to investigate and they're going to take opportunities to trial changes, engage in reading, um, engage in collaborative action research, trial changes to their practice. So all of the things that people have talked about so far, this is what they were being given license to do. Um, and at the end of the term, we're going to come back and we're going to share what we found found out what we've learned and we're going to put that into a document and that is going to be our assessment for learning and teaching policy and it's going to drive improvement and it's going to be about teacher autonomy and empowerment and you know when you're talking to someone and you can see that they think that you're slightly mad um and she looked at me and then she just said stop you're not going to do any of those things that isn't appropriate for a school that's requiring improvement you're going to go in and you're going to observe each teacher and you're going to give them a judgment against and you're going to say they're either inadequate requiring improvement good or outstanding like anybody likes to be told that they're inadequate and and isn't everybody requiring improvement because we're constantly wishing to engage and develop and she said to me that you you've got 16 months before they'll come back and if school hasn't improved from requiring improvement you could lose your job and that's quite a sobering thought when someone says that to you so i, I she left and i sat there and thought to myself look there's 740 odd kids here who've been failing but I've got three uh, very young children at the time at home. Um, and I thought, what am I going to do? So my, this is my message to everybody about not falling into this trap of this culture of compliance and control and power that is hierarchical right from the macro level into the institution in which we think by controlling teachers, we're, we're going to have the greatest impact on children. So I did the only thing I could do, completely ignored her advice went with what my research was telling me. Um, and uh, Tom, if you can just go to the penultimate slide, um, which is basically what was the findings of my research, because look, you've done that so much quicker than I could have done. So this is what I did. I looked at workplace learning theories. And my argument is that more learning takes place informally in a school that can ever take place formally in terms of your one hour meetings after school where most people are knackered and your five training days. And you can see how much government thinks about the, the quality of those training days by offering us uh, potentially a day off at, at the end of next week, but don't let me get onto that. So these were the main, um, if anyone wants to find out more, these were the main elements that if we introduce these activities, these sort of more formal learning activities into school, we will have an impact on the informal learning environment. And then we question everything. You question this assessment, you question the purpose of education, you question what we want to do as a school. And hopefully you've seen those underlined on the on the left of that slide in terms of all the things that we engage in as a team. And I know um, it's interesting. I think Mark Chatley is going to talk uh, in a moment. And I noticed Claire Vincent in the chat. So 
people who've come to visit us and, and see the work that we're doing. And the final slide is the so what, because people do not like, a lot of leaders or people feel uncomfortable with this feeling of, um, well, how are you going to uh, get the impact upon the children by empowering staff? Um, surely they will stop doing the work. Why do you need, do we really need book scrutinies, planning checks, lesson observations, continual rigmarole of monitoring? Um, but one thing, a couple of bullet points at the bottom there that I'm particularly proud of. The, the, our, my, I've been ahead of three schools, but the, the first school I've continued to be the head of in my ninth year and Flora I'm aware I've got about 30 seconds um we've just been awarded the mayor of London schools for success award for for four consecutive years and that is awarded in recognition of schools that are in the top six percent in terms of making impact on low prior retainers and, and what I'm arguing as a leader it is not difficult for me to lead a team of master's level uh, reflective creative innovative practitioners who are continually improving and developing and I would also argue that we won't be able to really change the assessment system or the curriculum if we're not empowering our teachers to be making um, to be in charge of decision making and that final bullet point bearing in mind we have a recruitment and retention crisis in this country in in that should read eight years now in eight years we spent a grand total of 20 28 pounds on advertising uh, recruitment and retention um, and we've got more teachers who, uh, that want to work at our school than we could possibly hold so uh, I'm really sorry that the that the program have to, had to be shifted around but I was absolutely determined to to have an opportunity to speak this I don't know where the slides were all, all over the place so I've just been talking but I, I was I was I have written an email to Flora and Tom to apologize for not being able to uh -oh. attend until this final, until this final laptop was discovered. <laughs> no apology needed. Uh, Tom would love to ask you some questions if that's okay, Coolburn. Of course. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, there were so many um, nuggets there that I've kind of picked up, Coolburn. I've, I've just written down a few quotes from you there. Uh, Don't fall into the trap of a culture of compliance and control. Um, and you mentioned about lesson observations and book checks and things like that. I loved what you said about um, stopping for a term uh all the kind of checking and monitoring stuff and i'm wondering um kind of whether you could just go into that in a bit more detail in terms of did you restart it after a term or did you say okay the research question you pose the research question um and you work on that research question obviously that requires trust in staff um as well um i'm wondering how the teachers responded to that um how long it took was there a moment where you had a bit of a panic and thought bloody hell you know i might lose my job and i need to go back to uh checking and compliance and recording and and, and putting pressure on staff and so on and so forth uh, or were you kind of settled into i've got 16 months and this is the way i'm going to do it and i don't care really at the end of that what's going to happen i'm just going for it yeah good great question tom and i never i've never done it so I never went, I, um, I don't check planning. I don't, uh, I enjoy reading with children and looking at books, but not to monitor and scrutinize. The, the journey of empowerment just continued. And the reason I call it a dynamic learning community is I, 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 I'm in, I'm currently leading a five form entry primary school, which, which, and I've been there about a year, which is, which is requiring improvement. So I, I know the importance of cultural shift. And I would say it takes at least three years. Um, and, and in the first school, it took three years. Remember, there are people, when, when practitioners have been successful in a culture of compliance, they don't necessarily like the shift towards um, empowerment. Yeah. But if you're, if you're developing a culture of high trust, you can have greater challenge. So we, we, we we'll, I'm sure we have much more challenging conversations, but focused on the learning of the children um and i'll give you a really brief example of um just so that you know the same teachers that were told they were crap basically so the requiring improvement and inadequate are the same teachers who now lead the school and have led it to outstanding even that's if we great, even, that, is absolutely even, that is even though, even though we don't worry about ofsted but um yeah a hundred percent so the first term we looked at assessment for learning for a term the second term we looked at dialogic teaching for a term and it goes on and on and on and 
um, I think it took uh, it took three years because people who aren't comfortable with that, people who prefer a hierarchical leadership style, people who prefer telling people what to do, found it uncomfortable and and moved on. Um, and um, the, the reason it's dynamic is then the purpose of, of creating an informal learning environment is it impacts most on the newest entrant. So every time we get a newly qualified teacher, yeah. they are sort of inducted into this way of working very, very naturally. Yeah. And I remember a moment that three NQTs joined in the fourth year. And for them, the environment was so much easier for them to engage in because um, they knew nothing else. So they've not known anything else in, those, in the five years since. Uh, about this culture of empowerment um, and and development, and um, just a final point where I've been in this into a school, you know, that the usually the people that find it the most difficult are the leaders because yeah. they suddenly haven't got that that feeling of well, I'm the one who judges, so you need to to listen to me. My job yeah. is to create, create an environment in which there's a really really powerful uh, learning community, um, and it and it. it it's so powerful, Tom, that I think that personally every school should work in that way and I don't understand why they don't. I mean, would you argue that, I mean, okay, let's say you're a head or member of SLT. I mean, the classic response would be, well, I've got Ofsted coming in, you know, six months or something or a year or whatever, so I can't afford to just do what you're saying. I mean, what would your response to that be? I, I'd say that... you. You can't afford not to. It's the first one. And the other thing I'd say is, uh, are we making decisions in the best interest of the children? So I'm I'm actually in that exact same position. December the 9th last year, I went in the school. The local, it was graded requiring improvement. The local authority said it was more likely to be special measures. And I've gone in and done exactly what I've what I've done here. Nine teachers are doing their masters. Um, we're developing. They, they're, they're more. They're going to be more confident in articulating. They're going to be more relaxed when people go into their classrooms. And they're how, going to how, how to you, their journey with those staff? How did you kind of like switch the culture with those staff? Like, did you just tell them, "Look, things are changing. I'm, I'm. You know, this is the new culture." I mean, did were they able to just adopt that, or or was the you know how does that work? I mean, when they've been stuck in that culture of compliance and control for so long. Well, well, what you've got to do, Tom, first of all, is you share the research with them, um, and when you when you share the research uh, about creating a more distributed leadership model, the yeah. only people who aren't going to like that are the my senior leaders, because all of a sudden their their locus of control is shifting. Now, yeah. either either they. Either they feel liberated and work alongside you to support the process. And obviously, Tom, I've been ahead for eight years. It's a lot easier now because people feel that you've got a bit of experience behind you. When I first went to the Highlands, I literally thought I was absolutely mad. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is that um, in my second school, uh, both associate heads left by Christmas and I started in September. And in this, in the school that I'm currently at, and really I started in January, I was just getting information in December. Um, one deputy left within two weeks. Um, well, and they, did, they couldn't handle not having the levers of compliance and control, or, or what? Yeah, and also because I, I you know, if I, if I say you can't talk to staff like that, you, yeah. you can't. And and you know, I don't want to go into detail, but. Well, I'm, when you when you suddenly get the voice of team leaders and year group leaders saying that they 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 are they're stressed that in within this culture of fear, um, the the and, and and in terms of Ofsted, yeah, Ofsted, Ofsted, I've been hanging over my shoulder at that school right the way through. But my responsibility isn't for this week. My responsibility is to enable uh, a, a system to be put in place that's sustainable for the next three to five years because it's short-term measures yeah. that, that impact negatively that's on right. our children. And, and and I'll tell you one thing that's in schools that um, are not doing so well, that the, that the focus is too often on the needs of adults rather than the needs of the children. Yeah, yeah. And by empowering class... I'll, I'll give one little example... Every class to every year, uh, key stage two class was in rows, right, and pairs. And and I said, well, I said to the teachers, why have you got your classroom in pairs and rows? Because if we're going to be doing dialogic teaching mm. and we're going to get children to engage in critical thinking and debate, we, we can't have them sat like this. And the the argument was, oh, we've been told to do that. 
and then, and then I just said, right, anyone who doesn't want to have it in rows can choose not to have it in rows. And not one teacher decided to keep the children in rows. So there you've got 20 key stage two teachers doing something that they don't understand the rationale of because we have this misunderstanding that consistency is every classroom looking the same when consistency should be consistency of values, consistency of aspirations, consistency of expectations of what we want for our children. So what happens then is it, when Ofsted come in and they're going to speak to the staff, the, 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 the staff are going to say, oh, it's so much better than it used to be. This is fantastic. We have a sense of well-being. We're more in charge of what we're teaching. The curriculum's yeah. more clear. Parents are going to be more engaged. So there are, there are different ways of looking at True. preparation for an inspection. And my job is to take pressure right off everybody. It's True. my job to take the pressure of Ofsted, nobody else. And when Ofsted comes, we're, we're just going to chill out for a couple of days and do what we normally do. Yeah. Do you know what, Colvin? I'm going to shut up now because I could literally talk to you all day, fella. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I could probably talk all day. And also, um, um, I've woken up very happy this morning, having have watched West Ham beat Leeds United last night. So oh, there you go. Well, we can. I can, in, I can see us in. But seriously, Colvin, that was um, you know, I've I've obviously watched a lot of different presentations with my role and, and teach me icons. This was um, absolutely fantastic and. I'd love to hear more at some point. It's honestly inspiring a lot of what you're saying. You know, it is radical and it is um, different than a lot of schools and a, and a lot of school leaders are doing at the moment. So fair play to you and uh, thanks a lot for sharing it. I'll pass over to Flora now. Cheers, Tom.